Good morning. morning. It's good to see everyone here this morning. Uh, Going through items in your bulletin, um, at 6 o'clock tonight, we'll have a baptism service in the old church, uh, just across the the driveway there. Uh, Wednesday, uh, Bible study and prayer meeting at 6, followed by a deacon's meeting at 7 o'clock. And then uh, make sure you take note of this, the new schedule for next Sunday. We will return to a full Sunday school at 9.30, and worship service will be at 10.30. Uh, Linda and Frank are still looking for potential teachers. If you're interested, um, there's a sign-up sheet or see Linda or Frank. Um, For those that are concerned about their coffee in the morning, uh, (laughs) their uh, uh, coffee will be started around 9 or 9.15, and since the adult class is in the fellowship hall, uh, they will have have coffee uh, with them during Sunday school. Uh, uh, Eat and Greet will be uh, Monday, September 27th in the Activity Center, and that'll be a dessert night. Uh, Sign up sheet on the literature tables, and that's if you're interested in participating in the bell choir. And the Apple Butter Festival will be uh, October 16th. There's a few spots for vendors still and spots outside. Um, Jamie and Mary are looking for donations for the Chinese auction. Uh, if you know of a business that would like to donate, uh, please let Jamie or Mary know. And I guess that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. If you uh, forget that we're at 1030 next week and you arrive at 10, that won't be as tragic as if we were moving the other way. So, you know, there is some grace built in. You'll just be here a little early. And uh, so we hope everybody will transition to the new times and Sunday school will resume. Uh, we're starting in larger age groups to before we get Sunday school going to break it down into different groups just for simplicity's sake. And due to, we're not sure how many folks will be coming. So, uh, but everybody is welcome. So we're glad to have you for Sunday school and church starting next week. Uh, And also coming up as we look down through fall, hard to want to look that far ahead. Uh, At the end of October, we'll be having a Sunday schools putting on an event, uh, trunk or treat event. Uh, There'll be more details forthcoming on that. Uh, So pay attention. There is a sign-up sheet out already but uh, we'll give you some more details. That's coming up at the end of October, so uh, just some things coming up this fall. We're going to look to the Lord and pray for our needs this morning, so why don't you join me as we pray. Almighty God, we thank you that we can bring ourselves together as a group and pray together for the needs that we have, the things that are listed in our bulletin. There are many of them. Many of them are physically related. And we certainly are uh, thankful that you're a healing God, a God who helps us when our bodies fail us. You're a God who provides for us. We today come to you and ask for these needs that are uh, in the bulletin, many of them, some longer term, some shorter term. We pray for uh, Wayne, who had surgery this week, to begin work to repair his ankle, and just pray that you would uh, continue to heal and help Wayne in this time of recovery. Uh, We pray for many others who are dealing with... uh, physical needs, that your touch would be upon them and your strengthening would be in their lives in a physical and spiritual way, even this week forthcoming. We pray as well today that you would provide for those who have uh, needs that are beyond the needs of our physical body, those who may have spiritual needs, those who may have temptation that they are fighting and battling and need strength, those who may have the need for wisdom or guidance in choices or decisions that they're facing those who may be in a difficult place in life or difficult circumstances, needing your daily provision to to get through those hard times. Uh, Whatever the need is, we are confident in your ability as our God to make provision for us. We look through the scriptures and we are uh, given great heart to to our cause and our problems to see how you provided for the problems of those in the pages of scripture, how you lifted people up back then, how you encouraged, how you strengthened, And we are reminded that you have not changed. You are the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so we trust you in these things. We trust you with our troubles, our sicknesses, our problems, our difficulties. We lay them before you and trust that you will do a work in the midst of them. Pray for our country and the needs that our country has. And they are also certainly significant. Pray for the needs around this world, the needs of our missionaries, the needs of safety for our military. 
We pray for all these things, looking to you, our God, to help and provide in these things. We are thankful for answered prayer, thankful for healing that you've already provided, thankful for how you've given wisdom, perhaps even just in this last week. And we come to you now thanking you for answered prayer. Give us a heart and a desire to thank you for the prayers that we brought before you this morning when we see that you answer them. We're thankful for the opportunities we have as a church, for the baptism tonight, for the many uh, things that we have before us that we are uh, doing and planning. We just pray that these things will uh, touch people's lives and minister the hearts and needs of people. We come before you now with all these needs that we brought as a group, but we also realize there are needs that we have in our own lives or hearts that cannot be brought to you as a group. Perhaps nobody, even on earth, knows the need of somebody's heart here but you do. And so we come with just a few moments of silence to bring those need before you individually, privately, for you to answer in the same way you answer the things we brought to you publicly, for we ask them all in Jesus' name. This morning's scripture reading is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 12, verses 16 through 25. Luke 12, 16 through 25, if you'd like to follow along as I read. And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do, because I have no room where to bestow my fruits? And he said, This will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there I will bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then whose shall those things be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasures for himself and is not rich toward God. And he said unto his disciples, Therefore I say unto you, Take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat, neither for the body, what ye shall put on. The life is more than meat, and the body is more than raiment. Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap, which neither have storehouse nor barn, and God feedeth them. How much more are ye better than the fowls? And which of you with taking thought can add to his statue one cubit? May God bless the reading of his word. Thank you, Ed. Children's Church will be dismissed. Last week we ended a series on 2 Timothy. Next week we will start a new series. So today we're doing one message by itself that, that stands on its own and is uh, not a part of a series today. We're going to put the, to practice the idea of learning from unpredictable events. As we know, yesterday was the 20th anniversary of the World Trade Center and Pentagon uh, terrorist attacks, uh, which occurred 20 years ago yesterday. And I want to read, I don't typically read to start a message, but I want to read a recount of one of the men who was and actually two of the men who were trapped in the World Trade Center that morning, they got out alive. Uh, and just uh, these, we, we perhaps saw lots of stories told about people escaping and what happened. You probably didn't hear these guys. 
uh, one of these guys in particular. His name was Stanley, with a last name that's just, for my tongue, unpronounceable. So he's Stanley. How's that sound? Stanley is an assistant vice president in 2001 with Fuji Bank, working on the 81st floor of the South Tower. These are his words that he wrote. He said, I saw huge chunks of fireballs falling from the North Tower. By that point, it had already been hit. And I took an elevator to the 78th floor of my building to switch to an express elevator to leave. The security guard said, your building is safe, it's secure, go back to your office. I stepped back into the elevator and went back into my office. The phone was ringing, so I answered it. I was standing up with the phone in my hand and I see something gray, a plane, small at first, then larger and larger. I mesmerized, not realizing a plane is coming toward me. The plane starts to tilt. It looks like time is stopping. And it happens in flashes of minuscule seconds. I can hear the revving sound of the engine and the plane is coming closer, closer, and closer. I dropped the phone, screamed, and dove under my desk. All I remember saying at that time was, Lord, I can't do this. You must take over. The bottom wing took out most of the floor I was on. It looked like a demolition, demolition crew had come in and ripped the entire office apart. Every piece of furniture was mangled. The only desk that stood firm was the desk I was hiding under. My Bible was on top of that desk. That's the only reason I can attribute to why I was saved. The ceiling above me collapsed. The sprinkler system came on. <clears throat> I was screaming for someone to help me. Please don't leave me to die. Somebody on the floor heard me and a person had a flashlight. That individual was a man who was searching to see if there was anybody on that floor. And he beamed his flashlight in, and his words about that were, my flashlight beam uh, was like a high beam on a country road at night. You could see fog, but nothing else. And then my flashlight caught the eyes of this man glowing in the fog. He said to me, first, one thing I need to know, do you know Jesus Christ? I told him, well, I do go to church every Sunday. Come on, we've got to get out of here. Back to Stanley's words. Stanley and this man with their flashlight climb across drywall, and they got to the point of the elevator. At that point, Stanley said to the other man, I'm banged up, bruised, bloodied, as was he. Uh, he stood on a desk, reached over the wall, grabbed me, and squirmed as we got out to the last place of the elevator. Uh, this guy dusted himself off, they dusted themselves off, they introduced themselves, uh, and he said to Stan, Stanley, said, I'm Stanley, you'll be my brother for life if we make it, make it out of here. And uh, the other man said, all my life I've lived as the only child, I've always wanted a brother. And they've had a friendship ever since. Uh, Stanley says, this guy did something, an act of kindness and love that I will go to the grave always remembering. We walked all the way down, that was 80 some floors of steps. On the ground I can hear firefighters, police, EMS workers, and men and women in uniform running, belching orders, telling us to run, to, to get out, just go, and they were sending us to safety. You could hear screaming behind us as we left, and it was before the buildings began to crumble. These men and women were sacrificing their lives so that we could be safe. And in hindsight, he says, the things that I took for granted, I no longer take for granted. The men and women in uniform, the firefighters, EMS workers before 9-11, I thought, oh, they're just doing their job. Now I know that had it not been for them, I would not have lived. And those are interesting words of a man who owed his salvation in that event to Jesus Christ. And God certainly had a plan for him that did not involve him dying in the tragedy. If you're old enough to remember 9-11, uh, we all remember perhaps snippets of that day, what we were doing, uh, what the plans were when we got up, and how the plans that we had envisioned when we got up that morning were quickly tossed to the wind and aside. If you're younger, you probably can't share that uh, memory of that. Uh, you can certainly look at what happened, uh, but uh, I guess unless you were there, it's hard to envision uh, the effect that that had on our society and our culture. At that point in time, I lived on the other side of New York State, a little more closely to New York City, 
and certainly uh, perhaps a little more affected as a part of the state than you were out here. But the scripture talks about unpredictable events. And the passage we read this morning tells us that we don't just endure them, we learn lessons from them. And we have a man here in Luke 12 who's woken up every day, it seems, to the normal daily operation of life. Just like on September 11, 2001, if you were around and old enough to remember, you woke up to just another day. I remember my schedule, and it was not unique. It was not with some major event plastered on the day. And so the day had not that tragedy happened would not be a day I would have remembered. How many of you remember a day in 2001, not that day, and you remember what happened on a day? Do you remember what happened on any other day in 2001, thinking back if you're old enough? Probably not, not well at least. And so that particular day and sometimes particular events change the course of our direction in life. Here's a man who has a course of direction in life. He's a rich man. For his time, for his day, for his life, he's rich, it says in verse 16. He is a rich farming man. Uh, he's uh, got crops and fruits. He's selling those crops. He's doing quite well at this. Matter of fact, he's doing so well at this, as, as Ed read to us. He says, you know, I have no more room to store all the harvest of my crops. And I need to uh, take down some of my old barns and build bigger. I need to expand my business. My business is booming. My fruits, my crops, everything about life is seemingly to go quite well. And it's interesting, when we look at this man, there is nothing said about this man as far as necessarily his style of living that would make us suspicious of him doesn't say he's an unruthless or, or bad businessman or an evil businessman or that he cheats his customers or that he is in some way, you know, this nefarious guy who just does all kinds of evil. He's just another successful businessman living his life. And as he lived his life, he just expected normal. And he expected normal with one thing that he didn't have, he didn't have a relationship to God. He's like millions and billions of people on the planet Earth today, trudging along, happily, going with the ups and downs, doing pretty well, not expecting unpredicted or difficult events to come. And so he's got his plans, and he's making plans. I'm going to build more barns. I'm going to expand my business. I'm going to earn even more money. He does seem to have a, a, a real like or love for money, and he wants to make more of it. And as a matter of fact, he's actually planning for something people didn't plan for back then, retirement. Now, we all plan for retirement because we all have social insecurity, don't we? And those checks are going to come in, hopefully, maybe, possibly, but we all try to plan for retirement, uh, you know, because that's the fact that we're now living long enough, we can outlive our functional working years. And so this guy's planning for retirement, verse 19, he says, so thou hast much goods laid up for many years, and then I'll be able to take my ease, eat, drink, and be merry, I'll be able to retire. By the way, don't count on retirement as being those years of ease, eat, drink and be merry. They may be like that, but they may not be quite as easy. They might not be quite as merry. Uh, retirement goes along with the problem why we do it, this body that fails us. Isn't that true? That's why we have to retire. Uh, this body doesn't carry us on to, to be able to go out and do crops and fruits and all this kind of stuff. So he's planning for retirement. And God doesn't say that the retirement plans are wrong. God simply says there's a problem in the equation this man has. There was a coming event for this guy that was going to be unpredictable, unforeseen, and render his planning a mute point. Because God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul be required of thee. 
Does everybody who plans for retirement get to retirement? No, that is the truth, isn't it? Not everybody who makes those plans gets there. This body sometimes doesn't have in all of our lives the traction to get us there. Things happen. Sometimes things happen that are, that are terrible, unexpected, unpredictable events. And people are taken. So we don't have a set guarantee that I can take you to the verse and take you to the passage, thumbing through my Bible, and say, Thou shalt have a wonderful retirement. You shall receive 90 years. That's a nice thought, but it's not promised. And so there's nothing wrong with that. But the part of the equation that this man didn't consider was God himself. God was not considered as a part of his long-range plans. He had the plans of expanding his business. Nothing wrong with that. God doesn't condemn that, except that God wasn't involved in it. Planning a retirement. God doesn't condemn that. There's nothing wrong with it. But God wasn't in those plans. And so for this man, the unforeseen, unpredictable event would leave him in eternity. And that is a massive change when it happens, a sudden change. And God comments on planning these things without God's involvement. Verse 21, So is he that layeth up treasure for himself, yet is not rich toward God. You know, the tragic downside to leaving God in eternity out is we can amass all kinds of stuff here. But when we die, it stays here. The family will litigate it, fight over it, uh, divvy it up. They'll have a big yard sale if you've got a lot of stuff. Lupa says, you know, when we leave, just sell it all the yard sale, right? Yeah, there you go. Just put it out there. Big yard sale. Uh, that stuff stays. You can amass it. Uh, by the way, it stays here, but you may not even have it given uh, to you or to keep it. Uh, some retirement plans just stop paying when you leave. That's it. You, you've reached the extent of the payments, and it's done if it's figured out that way and works that way. And so he left out the equation, God, and he ends up in eternity. We're not told how old this man is. We're not told how far ahead his plans are. But we gather that his plans are way ahead for retirement. He's much younger than that. We gather that he's right now in the, the active stage of expanding the business to make that retirement happen. And all of a sudden, something happens, and it's not an expansion of his business, and it's not his retirement. It's his leaving this life with his body failing and going to be in eternity. And he had not yet considered God. And when he landed in eternity, not being rich toward God, he found that he was accountable for his sin of rejection of God and all the other sins he's done. And that's not a happy moment to realize the best is behind you. And the life now is a life of accountability for what you've done, for your rejection of the love of God and his Savior, his Son today, Jesus Christ. And that's certainly not where God would want any of us to be. That's why he gave his Son. Likewise, for those of us who are here, this lesson, while less dramatic than the very unfortunate terrorist attacks, which took far more many people than this one man dying on one day, Oftentimes, it's when we witness death that it brings our brain back into alignment if we don't know Christ, that life is not just about the here, the now, and earth. It's about something eternal. It's about a place that our soul and our spirit are going to be for eternity. And he said, even using the word soul, thou hast laid up goods for these many years. But God says, soul, what have you done with Jesus that you can come to heaven to be with me? And so there's that eternal perspective, but there's also the earthly perspective. The earthly perspective is that when we're in the midst of hard times, it is our relationship with God that enables us and allows us to get through very unpredictable, unplanned unforeseen events. Because in verse 21, 
we end with that sad story. Then Jesus, in verse 22, looks at his disciples, and he starts talking to them. And I think we can turn this around to Jesus is talking to those who haven't believed, those who God is not a part of their life equation, those who don't have faith in Jesus Christ as their Savior, and that they even need a Savior. And he says, you are, you are dabbling with disaster if something happens and you leave this place. But then he looked to his disciples, and then he turns and looks to us and says this in verse 22. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life what she shall eat, neither for the body what she shall put on. Life is more than food. Life is more than just eating. Life is more than your body and just what you're wearing. And then he uses the illustration in verse 24 of birds that you neither sow nor reap, nor do they store it up. They just see God to feed them. And God says, how much more better are we than those birds that God takes care of? And then he touches the crux of the issue, verse 25. And which of you, with this phrase, taking thought? Probably in the Old King James, that's not a great translation because the word really means anxiety or worry. It really means to be torn apart by concerns for your future, to be held in suspense for your future. It really says, which one of you with anxiety, with worry, with concerns for your future, tore up by your future, can change it by your worry? That's a good question. If you have found a way to allow your worry and anxiety to actually change your circumstances, you need to write a book. Because you will earn a fortune on that book. How my worry changed my life. You know why none of you are writing that book? Because we all know it didn't change our life worrying about it, did it? Anxiety doesn't change circumstances. Anxiety doesn't do anything for the problem we're in the midst of. Sometimes it may make us feel good a little bit later, but it doesn't change anything. And Jesus said this, which of you can, uh, can change your circumstances by worrying about them? And of course, the answer the disciples had to have as they were standing there was, none of us can do that. And that's the crux of the issue of what Jesus does now. What happens when disaster happens? What happens when problems arise, unforeseen, unpredictable, sometimes dramatic, sometimes less dramatic, but still very difficult for you or for me individually? What does Jesus bring to life today? It's a, it's a nice thing. It's a great thing that he brings eternity for those of us who believed, that we're not going to function in this world forever. That someday we'll be in a place where there aren't the problems of this body. There aren't the problems of this world. There aren't all the situations around us that give us anxiety and worry and trouble. Someday we'll be with the Lord. That's wonderful. But what does he do for us today? And what he does for us today is he gives us reassurances of his presence and his provision that replace our worry. Uh, he says, consider the lilies in verse 27. They look marvelously adorned in their colors in the summer. And God takes care of them. Why won't he take care of us and clothe us? Uh, the grass of the field, you know, as it, as it dries and it burns, and yet God still causes it to grow back. And in verse 28, he asks this question at the end of the question, how much more will he clothe you? O oh, ye of little faith. He says, believe, trust me, and I will take care of you. It says, verse 29, Seek not what ye shall eat, nor what ye shall drink, nor be of a doubtful mind. For all these things do the nations of the world seek after, and your Father knows that you have need of these things. But rather seek ye the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. Kind of a famous verse, verse 31. Some of you may have memorized it. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. And then he says this in verse 32. Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. This is what God does for us when the world is coming apart at the seams. And the world will come apart at the seams. Sin and the presence of sin, the practice of sin, and the world being sinful guarantees it will come apart at the seams. 
over and over and over again. How can you fix this world? Well, I love politicians. They will tell you way after way after way that they can fix the world. They can't fix it. Because 10 years from now, some other person will be running, and they'll have their ways that they can fix the world. And guess what? It still needs the same fixing. And 20 years later, the same, same thing. Another person will be running for, for office. Same, I can fix it. Unless you can fix the problem of sin, it becomes almost impossible to fix the problems of this world. This world is destined to repeat the same problems that sin causes over and over and over. However, here is the fix that God provides. Remember this verse? And let the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. God has the true fix, and the fix isn't of the world. The fix is of us. He fixes us to get through this mess with his peace. Replacing our anxiety, our worries, our concerns for his work in our heart and life. His peace that comes to us. His protection that sustains us. Anxiety, all it can do is kill you. You know, they did some studies, and I'm not sure how scientific they are, but they've done some studies. And they say that people who worry more or have anxiety more tend to die earlier. Uh, it says your anxiety actually will cause you, your body to fail quicker. Um, I'm not sure how scientific you can actually be with that because, you know, you come down and say, well, how much do you worry? You know, it, it's a subjective matter. I can only know how much I worry or have anxiety, and I can't compare it to the rest of society. So it's a hard thing to really do a good study on. But I do believe this. Uh, what Jesus says is anxiety can't help you, and it might be able to hurt you, then we must find some other way. And how can you deal with the anxieties that are real? And there are anxieties that are real. We started talking about the anniversary of 9-11, and there was real anxiety, real concern, real problems. None of that was made up. None of that was fiction. None of it was uh, something that was not real. And certainly we had those concerns. We knew that what had happened was life-changing. How many of you remember after 9-11, white powder being mailed to people? Remember that whole thing? 9-11, you know, I was a part-time dispatcher back then in the 911 center, and 9-11 didn't seem to have a major impact upon our 911 center uh, because it happened, it was over, it wasn't in our uh, district, uh, and so, you know, nothing went on there. But the white powder thing, we had a page and a half of questions and protocols when people started getting white powder in the mail of what to do when people called us and say, I've got suspicious mail. Is it a box? Is it a package? Is it an envelope? And we went down our brand new protocol list to ask them all these questions about suspicious mail. And you'd be amazed at how many people all of a sudden started getting suspicious looking mail. I get suspicious looking mail every day. It's so suspicious I throw it immediately in the garbage. That's how suspicious the mail I get every day is. But it was amazing. We took call after call in little rural Washington County, New York, over people who got suspicious mail. Well, I don't know. I think, there, I think there's a powder on it. And we had the police to send, and we had a whole protocol. And if I remember right, how many of those actually turned out to be something dangerous or suspicious? If I remember correctly, in Washington County, a big old zip. None of them. Uh, none of them were suspicious. And so I remember that. But all oh, the anxiety, people had real anxiety. They looked at this piece of mail and it, maybe there's powder on it. Uh, it it's an address. I don't know who sent it to me. Maybe it's, maybe it's something dangerous. Maybe I ought not to open it. Maybe I should call 911. And I remember that very clearly because calls were regular for a while of the suspicious powder thing. Were there a couple of envelopes that really had suspicious powder in them when that happened? Yep, there were but not all the ones that were reported, of course. Uh, anxiety can just take you aside from your normal living and put you aside. But faith and trust in Christ, that's what we need. Oh, ye of little faith. Uh, you, you know, we need to trust Christ, that we don't have to be filled with anxieties and fears and worries about the events of this world. Should we be concerned about things we should be concerned about? Yes, concerned enough to pray? Absolutely. Uh, but should we be so 
boxed in by anxiety and fears that we are dysfunctional. Not if we're Christians. Not if we're believers. We aren't told about this man, but imagine the hypothetical situation that instead of this man who had the barns and had the business, instead of him suddenly passing, what if his barns suddenly burned down with his business? How would he have handled that? You know, we're not told. He didn't have God in his life to help him. We're not told how he would have dealt with such a backward event to his life that his business were to have come apart. By the way, they didn't have fire insurance back then. So you're, you're, with, you're with what you're with. Burnt down buildings. Business is done until you can somehow afford to rebuild them. What would he have done? We don't know, but I know this. If your building's burned down, God is still with you. I know that if troubles come to life, God is still with you. Unpredictable, unplanned, unforeseen events come to your life. God is still with you if you are a believer. And we have not need to just give ourselves over to worry and fears and anxieties because God is still with us. I remember September 12th as well. You see, some of you only remember September 11th in 2001. I remember September 12th. It was the day after all of those events. Life goes on. And my life on September 12th uh, was to stack and split the last of my firewood before I started hauling it home. Those were the days where we had fuel oil. If you know anything about fuel oil and you can burn wood, you burn wood because fuel oil was terribly expensive. Uh, from these, the lands of natural gas. It's not an argument anymore to burn wood, unless you can't don't have natural gas lines in your front yard. But nobody had those there, so I burned wood. And I was just about done splitting it. It was mostly all stacked. Very shortly after that, I was going to start hauling it home. I was in a hay. Was, I always cut my wood beside one of the family farm's hay fields. And in this case, this day, there was a little bit of a rolling hill that rolled off down into a swampy area where we didn't have field. The hay field was on the top, and we stopped haying when that roll came in. And on that little area between that and the swamp, there was firewood that I'd cut. And I was happily splitting the last of it, happy to be done with the splitting portion of this, looking forward to just in a week or so after that to start bringing it to my porch where it'd stack, and then I'd burn it from there. As I was doing that that morning, it was the day after 9-11, September 12th, all of a sudden I hear something in the background, and it gets louder. It was the sound of jets. Now, if you remember, on 9-11, planes were grounded. There were to be no planes in the air. And as it was very evident, this noise I was hearing was getting louder quickly. Well, I was down in this little dip, and I didn't do what you might have done, or perhaps what I could have done. I didn't dive for cover. Look, I figured if a terrorist is attacking again, and they, th and they misconstrued Washington County, New York, for Washington, D.C., they are really, really dumb. <laughs> More cows than people in Washington County, New York. So, you know, I didn't fear that the bombs were coming. So I scrambled up the hill to look, and very low and very fast, unlike anything I'd seen ever flying over Washington County, New York, were two fighter planes. Yes, they were ours, thankfully. You could tell. They were that low, and boy, they were loud. And they just soared across the sky. And I just stood there going, what is going on now? So being of the curious type, I got in my truck and turned on the radio. You know, if something big is going on, I want to know about it. I'm not just going to keep splitting my firewood. And on the radio, I switched from a few AM and FM stations. And, uh, you know, there was just typical. Nothing unusual. There had been no further terrorist attacks. There was nothing of any variety that made me uh, go, oh, no. And it's, I sat there for 10, 20 minutes, somewhere in that variety, flipping channels, trying to find out why on earth are, you know, our planes soaring over the top of us. Well, later we would all hear, because it would make the news later, in a little private airport in Granville, New York, not far from Fort Ann, where I was pastoring, and kind of not far from Greenwich, where I was getting my firewood, uh, apparently a little private plane operator didn't realize that that banning on flights actually applied to his wee little two-seater. 
and it was another gorgeous day, and he decided it was a good time for a flight. However, it wasn't a good time for a flight. He was intercepted by these two fighters, and he was escorted back to landing and was in a fair measure of trouble for what he had done. And I got to thinking about that later, and I thought, you know, how did they spot one little two-seater that launched from the middle of nowhere, no offense to any people from Granville watching this, uh, but from the middle of nowhere, Washington County, New York, how'd they even spot this thing? But they did, and it made the news, and they brought it back to Earth. He willingly complied. I can only guess what would have happened had he not, but he willingly complied and landed his little plane. And those jets that sound so ominous, those jets that sounded so terrible, as they were coming and as they flew over that looked so concerning were simply protecting us. And sometimes we forget that no matter what we're going through here, God is protecting his own. Not necessarily the guy who's building his own business without God. Not necessarily someone who's completely ambivalent or even hostile toward God, but for those of us of faith, when he turns to us, the disciples, and says, don't worry, anxiety can't do anything to change it, trust me, he's protecting us. And those two fighters were protecting us, and even in a more so and greater way, God says, I'm looking down, and if you are my children, believers by faith and trust, I'm protecting you. Even when unforeseen, unpredictable, difficult problems come up. Let's pray. Father, may we turn our perspective toward you and understand that our faith changes life. It is the truth that all of us will have a moment in time that we will enter eternity. It is also true that none of us know when that moment will be. And it is also likely true that until that moment comes, there's going to be turmoil and troubles and problems and circumstances that we all will face. That's the manner of this life. And yet in the midst of that, we can be like the man building his business and planning his retirement without even thought of you and face disaster or we can be like what Jesus was challenged his disciples to be like. People of faith, of belief, overcomers, overcoming anxiety and worry and fears, overcoming circumstance and situation that are difficult by merely putting our whole faith and trust in you. May we do that this week. May we learn from the unpredictable. For this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to close with a song this morning. Here's something that is predictable for a Christian. For a Christian, it's predictable that someday when we go home to be to heaven, we are going to see our Savior face to face. And that's predictable. More predictable than anything you can put in tomorrow's calendar will be that when you go home, you will see Jesus. And that's what we're going to close and sing about this morning. Face to face with Christ my Savior. Stand together as we close.
And if we're believers, that's what we're looking forward to. And there's assurance to that from Scripture. Father, we thank you for the Word of God, for the assurance it gives us, for the hope it gives us, for the peace it gives us. Even though living in days of turmoil and difficulty, we do not have to be filled with turmoil, difficulty, worry, anxiety, nor fear. We have you as Savior, you as Lord. It's a battle some days. It's a, it's a war against Satan who would like us to be filled with all those things. But fill us this day, we pray, instead with the fruit of the Spirit, which is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, patience, perseverance. May that mark us as believers. That we pray for us this week. And if there's any who are watching this or here this morning who do not know Christ, have available to them all of those things of peace and the fruit of the Spirit. May they humble themselves right now and understand and admit before you that by faith they need you. They need the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus to forgive their sin and to go to heaven and to be with you in this life and to have you in this life. And that without Christ they are separate from you. And that will not change a shy of their belief and faith. And may that realization come to perhaps even one who hears this this morning and believes upon you. We thank you again for what you'll do for us as we follow you as Christians, for we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.